Hello everyone, my name is Natalia and this is my YouTube channel Seagull the Explorer. Today I'm going to make another reaction video which was requested in the comments for, uh, for my other reaction videos and today it will be the video from Geography Now about Spain. Not only have I been to Spain, I actually lived there for some time when I was studying there. I stayed uh, the, uh, in the Basque country and maybe I know a little more about the Basque country although I cannot say that I know that much so I'm actually quite interested in this episode uh, I am really interested to learn some information about Spain for some reason I haven't traveled much around Spain and also in the Basque country as well when I was there so I I am really interested to know some facts to, um, about this country so let's dive in all right, Spain. I don't really have to say much. You've all heard of this country. Along with France and Italy, it is one of the three powerhouse Latin countries of Europe. Portugal, we love you, man. You're cool and awesome, but like, let's be real. You're kind of like the mini boss before the... Okay, I'll just stop right there. Anyway, over 500 million people across the world speak Spanish. And if you include the mestizos, a huge chunk of that population have actual descendants and ancestors from Spain. So it's not just language. It's also like genetically, Spain got busy and made a big ass family across the world. In any case, welcome to the original kingpin of the Hispanic world. Spain. It's time to learn geography. Now! Hey everybody, I'm your host Barbs. Don't forget to get Geography Now merch at geographynow.com. So Spain, everything from the freezing glaciers of Patagonia to the freezing glaciers of Alaska have at some point been imprinted upon by the notorious Spanish seal. And of course, it's always great to have people from the country in the country episodes. And with that, here's Jose and Anna. Say hi to them. Hello everyone. Whoa. Hi. All right, so where are you guys from? I'm Anna and I'm from Valencia. I'm Jose and I'm from Catalonia, from a town called Blanes. Uh-oh, Valencia, Catalonia, what's going on? <laughs> So, something about paella. We'll, we'll talk see. about that later. <laughs> All right. So, shall we uh, comenzamos? No. No. Uh, well, I'll make it up to you guys with some cervezas. Yeah, close. Okay. Si, I got it. Okay. What? <laughs> oh my God! You're lucky we're here, because if not, you will be fucking it up all the time. This is so interesting. This is the first time I've had two hosts on the show at the same time. <laughs> like, we're all like bumping into each other. Oh, well. Now, we've covered a lot of countries that have loose forms of administrative division within their political regions. But with Spain, I kind of see it like a teacher with a really rowdy classroom. It's like, hey, you kids, you stop that. Galicia, hey, hey, you stop talking to Portugal. Basque and Navarre, I don't know what you're talking about. Rioja, you stop drinking wine. Extra Maduro, do you even e exist? Valencia, hey, you stop burning everything right now. Catalonia is trying to jump out the window. What? Oh, get here, you little. Uh, no, but for real, the people in Spain just know who they are and they own it. And with that, let's go to the animation. All right, Spain is located in Western Europe, taking up about 82% of the Iberian Peninsula, shared with Portugal to the west, the Bay of Biscay to the north, and to the south, subsections of the Mediterranean, known as the Balearic and Alberon Seas, and inland, the Pyrenees Mountains separate them from France and Andorra. Keep in mind, they even have this small little exclave in France called Yivia, cut off by about 1.6 kilometers okay. of space to the Spanish border on the N-154 highway. Up north on the Bidasoa River, Spain also shares an island with France called Isla de los Faisanes, or Pheasant Island, in which the sovereignty switches every six months. Those aren't the only countries that border them, though. In the southeast by La Linea de la Concepción, you find mm, this place Gibraltar? Gibraltar, which is yes. actually an overseas territory of the UK that they have had since 1713 with the Treaty of Utrecht. In addition, Spain also has the Plazas de Soberanía, or Strongholds of Sovereignty, Sovereignty, historical mm. places in northern Africa that date back to the inception of modern Spain in the 15th century and they hold on to. They include the two exclave autonomous cities of Ceuta and Melilla, which are effectively attached to Morocco. In addition, there are also eight other islands and one peninsula known as Peñón de Vélez de la Gomera. The peninsula is divided by a 100 meter wide sand bridge, which makes it one of the shortest international borders in the world. From there, Spain also okay. has two main archipelagos, the Canary Islands off mm. the coast of Morocco, of and again, of course, the Balearic 
Canaric Islands in the Mediterranean. Due to the positioning of the Canary Islands, this gives Spain two time zones, UTC 0 and plus 1. With that, Spain breaks down a little interesting. The country is classified as a decentralized unitary state in which although sovereignty is vested in one nation, the regional institutions hold their own high degree of self-governance and have their own parliaments and presidents. These 17 entities are called autonomous communities or autonomies in short. Ceuta and Melilla are categorized as autonomous cities and have the right to become communities but so far have not expressed interest in doing so. The capital and most populous city and highest capital in Europe is Madrid in the center of the country. Like literally it is. There's even mm. a floor plaque called the Puerta del Sol which serves as kilometer zero for all the roads and train networks that radiate outwards from the central hub. And of course yeah, I also heard about this, that Madrid is actually in the geographical center of Spain. This is cool. Of course, Madrid holds the biggest and busiest airport, Adolfo Suarez, Madrid, Barajas International. From there, the second largest city is Barcelona on the Mediterranean coast, where the second busiest airport can be found, Barcelona El Prat International. And, okay, maybe I'm, I'm wrong here, but... From the people that I uh, communicated with, it seems like Barcelona is the most popular city uh, to visit in Spain. I, I'm not sure if it is true. Uh, maybe, it's the, maybe it is Valencia or Sevilla or Madrid. But from my experience, Barcelona is... From there, the busiest shipping port is the port of Argeciras Bay, where over 100 million tons of cargo pass annually. Finally, fun fact, some parts of Spain are actually antipodes of New Zealand, which means they are literally located exactly across the entire planet from each other. So, fun fact, Canary Island are not named after canaries, but rather dogs, because of the Latin can. Which means dog. What means dog? Like exactly. canine. Huh? That was marginally interesting. Now, we're not gonna dive too much into it because it would take forever, but... Why so many autonomous? Well, historically, Spain had a few major kingdoms before they unified. And this is basically how they separate places that either have a very distinct people group versus places that were are more in sync with Madrid centralized power. And speaking of which it's forced, Spain is a monarchy. Yes, one of the 12 monarchies of Europe. Basically, most people will say it all started when Isabella de Castile married Ferdinand of Aragon, unifying the two biggest powerhouses of the Iberian Peninsula. Even though they kind of pissed off the Pope because they were second cousins and did not dispensate their marriage which led them to cursing the Spanish people for all eternity but then they waited for the next pope and he dispensated their marriage so anyway the point is after millennia of going through the Phoenicians Romans the Suevi whatever those guys were Vandals and Alans Visigoths the Moors and Umayyads modernish Spain started to take shape in the 1400s with a reconquista or reconquering and from there the story gets crazier how so? You sure you're not bored with all this history stuff? Normally I would be, but all the pictures and the fast meta talk uh, holds my attention and makes me think I'm learning. Thank you for revealing my script writing structure, but anyway, fine, if you insist. After the Reconquista, the sexy Habsburgs slipped into the royal family because that's what they did throughout everybody in Europe. And when their line ended the House of Bourbon, a French dynasty slipped in. And here we are today with Philippe VI and his daughter, Princess Leonor, next in line. In any case, Spain is a travel hotspot. They are literally the second most visited country on earth after France, with more than 83 million people recorded as of 2019. On Earth? Okay. Interesting. Yeah, well, um, it's not that surprising if you think about it, because really so many people, when you ask them what is their favorite destination, it will be either Spain or Italy. I don't know, maybe this is just, you know, my friends and acquaintances, but yeah, a lot of people love Spain. 19. It's important to know that Spain has third highest number of UNESCO World Heritage Sites at 48. The Autonomy of Andalusia has the most at 7. Now we all know some of the obvious UNESCO sites like the Alhambra, the Great Mosque of Córdoba, the Guggenheim. Oh, the Guggenheim. Okay, let just a second. UNESCO sites like the Alhambra, the Great Mosque of Córdoba, the Guggenheim. Okay, the Guggenheim. Yeah, I was there. Uh, Bilbao is the... Um, well, the busiest and I think it is the biggest city in uh, the Basque country. It is not the capital. Uh, the capital is Victoria Gasteis, I think. Although I'm not sure, but coming back to the Guggenheim. So apart from having great architecture, right? And also a giant spider statue in front of the building. 
which I'm not sure why it is standing there. I haven't explored it. Um, I was really surprised when I saw it. So yeah, but uh, I visited it, uh, the museum. So yeah, it, it was quite interesting. I'm not big into arts, but I really loved visit. I really loved uh, my visit to this museum. So it has three floors. The entrance uh, to the museum was. Uh, 15 or 16 euro when I visited it. Uh, it was November 2018. By the way, if you have a student card, you can have a discount. But you need to be not older than 26 year old. Otherwise, you won't get a discount, which was a little bit frustrating. So it has three floors. Uh, on the ground floor, uh, there were giant installations um not only i'm not big on art but i'm also not big on art on modern art meaning that i really don't understand but it was quite interesting to walk around those um uh, installations uh on this first floor as far as i understand usually there are uh temporary exhibitions and at the time of my visit um works of a Swiss artist and sculptor uh, were displayed. I don't remember his name. I do remember that he has he ha he has a an Italian name, but I need to check uh, to check his name. So his works uh, were quite interesting. Uh, I especially like the portraits. Um, so they were made in black and white, gray tones. But what was really, really catching my eye, and well, not I guess not only mine, the eyes of on those portraits, portraits, uh, they were very, very expressive. So that was the second, uh, sorry, the first floor. And on the second floor, usually there are the works of more classical art. So works by Picasso or Van Gogh can be found there. And yeah, I think it, it, is, uh, it is worth visiting for sure, uh, the museum. Behind the Sagrada Familia Church. Which has been under construction for like 130 years. It would take way too long to cover all the UNESCO sites, but here's a list of some non-UNESCO sites you guys suggested we mention in the episode. The Royal Palace in Madrid. Centenil de las Bodegas. Valencia's Arts and Science Districts. Theme parks like Puerto Ventura and Parque Warner and Texas Hollywood. The Canary Islands have pyramids, mummies, and the Neptune statue. The wooden mushroom thing in Seville, Metropole Parasol. Madrid claims to have the oldest continuously operating restaurant in the world. World. Cadiz is the oldest city. And fake Germany, Mallorca, and fake UK, Ibiza. And so on. Yeah. Honestly, from the places that they that they mentioned, I only visited Madrid. No, actually, I haven't visited the Royal Palace. Uh, I was in Madrid, but only for a couple of hours. No. Yeah, I. I didn't visit it, even Royal Palace. So from all the places that they, that they mentioned, I visited none. So uh, more, more reasons to go back to Spain, right? Oh, by the way, yeah, I actually need to go to Spain at some point because although more than two years passed after my graduation, I still didn't receive my diploma. <laughs> I actually have no idea why. I mean, I graduated, I got my um, mark for my diploma, I mean, for my research work, but yeah, I don't have the diploma from my Spanish university. Yeah. Yeah, that list doesn't even give Spain justice because it's not even a small fraction of the big picture. One part of that picture, though, is the landscape and resources. Which brings us to... <laughs> So since Spain has territories in Africa, the ocean and Europe, it's transcontinental. So we have like many different landscapes. Like we even have a restaurant that cooks food over an active volcano. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's go to the animation. First of all, for the continental part, the country is incredibly mountainous. In fact, the second most mountainous country in Europe after Switzerland. The country has six main ranges, the Betic chain in the south, the Central and Iberian chains in the center, the Cantabrian and Leon chains in the north, and the Pyrenees in the northwest with the border 
border of France and Andorra. In the center, you have the Meseta Central Plateau, a wide highland that stretches wide across the interior. As you can clearly see from space, the northern part of Spain has the most lush green wet zones, and as you head south, the country obviously gets more dry and arid. In fact, Spain has the only true desert of mainland Europe, the Tabernas Desert, located in Andalusia, which holds the highest temperatures of mainland Europe at over 40 degrees Celsius in the summer. These mountains are essentially a byproduct of Spain being located right at the confluence of the African and Eurasian tectonic plates, creating a slew of minor rifts and fault lines. This means the southern part of Spain may occasionally experience earthquakes above 6 on the Richter scale, and certain areas mostly along the Mediterranean have extinct volcanoes. The most active volcanic area of the country, though, would actually be the Canary Islands, which lie on an interplate volcanic region on the African plate. Geologists mostly agree that the islands were created by the plates moving over a mantle hotspot, which bubbled up out of the ocean, much like how the Hawaiian Islands were formed. Speaking of islands, the highest point of the country isn't even on the Iberian Peninsula, but rather the Canary Islands, part of the larger subregion known as Macaronesia, with Mount Teide, which is actually the third highest volcano in the world from its base. Back to the mainland, though, the highest mountain on continental Spain would be Muracen, at nearly 3,500 meters high. From there, the longest river, shared with Portugal, is the Tagus, or Tejo. However, the longest river entirely in Spain is the Ebro. Now, most of the inland bodies of water are reservoirs blocked up by dams on rivers. However, the largest natural freshwater lake would be Lake Sanabria in the northwest. Finally, Spain has three main climate zones on the continental part. The areas in the south have a warm, dry Mediterranean climate. The central Meseta Plateau has hot summers and cold winters. And the north Cantabrian mountains have a maritime climate with the most rain year-round and snowfall in the winter. So an extra side note, after Malta, Spain is the sunniest country in Europe, like 260 days a year. That's hot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's hot. <laughs> <laughs> now with all these rugged lands, Spain hosts a wide range of flora and fauna, differing by region. For example, the Canary Islands, you have the black sand beaches and the ancient tropical Lora Silva. It's only found in Macaronesia. Otherwise, on the peninsula, you have everything ranging from green hills that look like a Scotland in the north to the shrubby rocky Arizona-like deserts of the south. Within these wide-ranged zones, you have tons of natural treasures like caves, canyons, and even a river that flows orange and red. Agriculture-wise, they are the second largest producer of wine after Italy, and the largest producer of olive oil in the world. On oh, fun side note, when they cook, only about 40% of Spanish homes have direct gas lines installed, and the rest usually have gas tanks delivered, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. bombonas. Now we all know that despite having the 13th largest nominal GDP in the world, Spain has had quite a reputation for its rather... How can I put this? Recessive tendencies? <laughs> <laughs> yes, during the financial crisis, Spain was hit hard for about six years during 2008, and in 2014, they reached the height at about 27.2% unemployment. There are a lot of factors that went into this, but it kind of went... How could we grow our economy? We need to build a lot of stuff. Okay. What's the problem? The banks. What if we just let the banks report what they wanted and not regulate them as much? That's a great idea. Nothing could go wrong. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> And it did. Perfect storm. And due to this lack of accountability, experts speculate that somewhere upwards to one-fifth of the total GDP is somehow tied in with the undisclosed transaction industry black market, second only to Italy. No proud of that. You guys probably have a lot to say about that. No surprise, Spain? <laughs> Galicia. Is known for being the main port of entry for the European cocaine trade. A fun little fact, did you guys know that over 90% of euros that are transacted in Spain have trace amounts of cocaine on them? <laughs> 90? Like 90? Over 90%. Yeah. Really? Oh, wow. I'm just thinking, did I have cash when I was there? I did. I most certainly did. Okay, food for thought. Yes, there was a study in Valencia's science community. But anyway, off of that. Spain is the fifth largest producer of wind energy in the world. We even have the world's largest renewable energy operator, Iberdrola. We are the eighth largest automobile producer in the world and second largest manufacturer in Europe after Germany. We even have some of the domestic brands like Seat. Which is actually a subsidiary of Volkswagen, but let them have that one. And the incredibly rare limited produce and expensive GTA Hispano. What else is rare in this country? Some of the animal species. And with that, here's Gary Harlow to explain. Right, it's Gary Harlow here in Europe. 
Spain and Italy usually rank in the top two in regarding biodiversity. I mean, they've got tropical forests to desert, so there's lots of wildlife real estate. The country hosts 16 national parks, the largest one being the Sierra Nevada in the south. Like Portugal, they share the same type of famous Iberian animals here, like the Spanish Ibex and the wild boar. However, they're known for the Spanish Big Five, the bearded vulture, the Iberian lynx, the Iberian wolf, the imperial eagle and the Eurasian brown bear. The national animal, however, mm. is the bull. Some of might course. say the Hispanic lion. Some historians claim that they might have inhabited southern Europe. It's in dispute. Lots of reptiles are endemic too, especially on the island regions. The Canary Islands have about five native species of gecko. Blah, blah, blah. That was a very good impression of a gecko. <laughs> Otherwise, as a country that's in the path of migratory birds from Africa to Southern Europe, there's over 630 bird species. Speaking of migration, I've got to migrate out here, fading into the distance. Thanks, Gary. Now we're about to talk about the food of Spain, but before we do, you have to understand there's a few things. What is food culture in Spain to you guys? What does that mean? What does it entail? Every meal kind of blends into the nice. following meal. Next one. There's like a whole system, right? Mm -hmm. It starts with breakfast, maybe some churros and chocolate and then uh, what have un aperitivo and then you have lunch and lunch normally ends up with what we call sobremesa that it's like just talk but you stay at the table and you stay at the table you don't have to go out of the, of the bar or even if you're in a house and then merienda which is a little snack we have in the afternoon before dinner and so then... that's why we have dinner at 10 p.m it just keeps going never, never stop. stop never stop we eat and then, and then eat again and then maybe go you know dancing or something but <laughs> while you're dancing you also eat you gotta do flamenco <laughs> with some Probably. fun fact spain is one of the countries in the world that has more bars per citizen and you can even get beer in mcdonald's right yes yeah, true. Yeah, that was so impact when I came here. Yeah. Anyway, and with that, here's uh, some food stuff with, uh, oh, guess who's back? Noah. Food. Prior to the 15th century, Europeans had no idea that things like chocolate, corn, tomatoes, potatoes, avocados, and sugar even existed. Through the Spanish trade routes, the rest of the world was introduced to these items, and now you can have things like pizza and fries. Great items. In any case, every region of Spain has a different style of cuisine, and the gastronomy is top-notch, world-renowned. We don't have time to explain them all, but some dishes you guys, Spanish geography pizza, that every Spaniard will most likely have access to include things like gazpacho, terethnos, churros, croquet, Ketas, lechazo, cochinillo, arroz a la zamorana, ornazo, jamón, fideuá, cocido, and tortilla. This is not the same as a tortilla in Latin America, though. This is a potato and egg dish. And probably the most world-renowned mm, dish, paella, paella, originated in Valencia. And they are strict with the way that it is made. They hate it when this happens. Hey, can I have some of that paella? I've heard so much about it. Yeah, sure. It comes with extra muscles and shrimp, because that's paella. It does? Yeah. Okay. Sure, whatever, just take it. The true way to make it is either with rabbit or chicken. Otherwise, Valencians will call all the imposters aroth con cosas, or rice with things. Well, that's all I got for you today. Until next time. Interesting. Okay. Or eat a paella in Madrid or Barcelona. But to eat the real one, go to Valencia. And probably after this, many people is gonna want to kill me. <laughs> I just buried myself. Fun fact. Uh yeah, well, apparently I didn't try re the real paella, so I haven't visited Valencia. I've been to Madrid and Barcelona, which is where I tried paella. So maybe, yeah, uh, okay. So another reason to go to Valencia then. Okay. Sherry was also invented here, as was the Molotov cocktail, which played a huge role in the Spanish Civil War. Well, let's talk about the Spanish people now, shall we? <laughs> Now, as I mentioned, there's a lot of different types of people in Spain and they all kind of have their own thing going on. In a way, we have this kind of quiet acknowledgement that unity doesn't mean uniformity. What do you guys think? Like, do you guys generally get along? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes, but... Yes? <laughs> yes. There's like these stereotypes, things mm. that, oh, he probably is this way because he's from this place or mm -hmm. he's probably, you know? I'll say when I've met 
Spanish people outside of Spain. We all love Spain and love everyone. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it just when we're in Spain, we love to, you know, talk sh to each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, with that, let's talk about the people of Spain in the graph. First of all, Spain has about 48 million people and is the fifth most populous country in Europe and has the highest life expectancy in the OECD countries. The country is made up predominantly by people that identify as native Spaniard at about 88%. Keep in mind, this label is very broad and pretty much pertains to a wide range of people with different physical traits, but mostly with a South European Mediterranean background in their racial makeup. Geneticists also have determined that the average Spaniard, especially in the South, has around 5% North African ancestry due to the Moorish conquests that took over the country for seven centuries. The remaining 12% of the country is made up of various immigrant groups that have settled over the centuries, the largest ones being Latin Americans at about 5%, North Africans and Eastern Europeans at about 2% each, and the remaining 3% from other places around the world like Asia and whatever. All right, so the official language of Spain is shocker. Spanish, but specifically Castilian or Castellano Spanish. Yeah, of course we have a uh, Spain Spanish dialect, which sounds a bit different than Latin American Spanish. Mm -hmm. Now keep in mind, most Latin American Spanish is heavily influenced by the Andalusian dialect of Spanish, as many people from those areas moved and migrated to the Americas. Long story short, what's the easiest way to piss off a Spaniard? Vale, voy a empezar mi nuevo proyecto en mi nuevo ordenador. Elige el idioma inglés, no. Francés, no. Español. ¿Alguien me puede explicar por qué está español con la bandera mexicana? ¿Alguien podría explicarme por qué? Porque el español de Europa es el español. Hey, it's not Mexico's fault they became a big deal in the Hispanic world. Anyway, on top of that, despite Spanish being the national language, they have three other regionally co-official languages that are allowed to be publicly used and published alongside Spanish. So we have Catalan, Galician, Basque. But Basque is a language, like it's its old age. Historically, no one knows where it comes from and doesn't have anything to do with Latin or any other language. There's also other minority Romance languages like Asturianese and Aragonese, but very few people speak them and they don't really pursue to officiate them. And there's other offshoot languages like Ladino, spoken by the Sephardic Jewish community. The coolest language fact though is that on the island of Gomera in the Canary Islands, they use Silbo Gomero, which is taught in schools. It's a language completely composed of whistles. Here's a clip if you want to hear some. You didn't even know that. Yeah, oh, we're all learning. Yeah, we could talk about language stuff in Spain all for hours. It's crazy, but we got to move on. Wait, before we move on. Yeah, um, I didn't know about the whistling language as well. It's interesting. So, but before we move on, so I have something else to add about the languages in Spain. So, as they mentioned, uh, the official language is Spanish. By the way, um, there are 66 languages that are listed for Spain, meaning that you can hear them in Spain. Uh, 20 of those 66 have some established status, meaning either they are official or uh, co-official or um, they are developing anyway they have some kind of status but um there are only 20 of those and 46 they don't have uh, a status in spain meaning that most likely they they are just based on nationalities that live in spain so uh as was already mentioned spanish is an official language and um around 46.4 million people speak Spanish in Spain. And it was also mentioned that all in all in the world, uh, yeah, this number is way higher. And uh, it is 548 million people speak Spanish in the world. Um, so according to a 2019 Pew Research survey, the most commonly spoken language at homes apart from Spanish were Catalan, Valencian, Galician, and Basque. By the way, about Basque. So as I mentioned, I've been to, not only I've been to, I've lived in the Basque country for some time. So, well, it is 
well, it is a region that is closer to me. So uh, Basque language, as it was as was mentioned in the video already, it is the only surviving language isolate in Europe. And the current uh, mainstream scientific view on origin of the Basque language is that the early forms of Basque developed before the arrival of Indo-European languages in the area, meaning that the Basque language is really, really old. So I mentioned that there are 66 uh, languages um, in Spain. All of them are living, but there is one language that unfortunately has the language of uh, sorry, uh, has a status of being a dying language. So, unfortunately, maybe soon it can become extinct. This language is called Eromincella. By the way, I'm not really sure about the pronunci pronunciation of, the, uh, of this name. So, this language is scattered in País Vasco autonomous community, and País Vasco is the Basque country. So there are 500 people that speak this language in Spain and there are another 500 people that speak this language in France and that's it. So uh, so there are all in all a thousand um, speakers of the language and yeah, uh, the status of this language is dying. So among other languages uh, that are spoken in Spain, English. There are 10 million 10.8 million people that speak english in spain which is about 22 percent of the population well the number is not that high but well um i think spanish and spain in general is considered a country where english is not really much spoken and to my experience by the way uh yeah, I, I sh well, mostly I agree. Um, so I lived in San Sebastian. So uh, in Basque, by the way, it is called Danostia. This is a touristic uh, city. So there are many tourists, but still uh, the, yeah, not so many people speak English there. As a Belarusian, I was interested to learn that there are um, there are some people that speak Belarusian in Spain and uh, the number is uh, five uh, five thousand six hundred people this is based on nationality by the way so it means that this number of people of Belarusians live in Spain uh, among other languages that are spoken there are Czech, Czech Bulgarian Danish Ukrainian Georgian and many others as I said, there are 66 all in all. The number of speakers can range from a thousand to a couple of hundred thousands. Or, as in the case of French, uh, there are 2.2 2 million, 2 .2 million uh, speakers of French in Spain. So, yeah, that is it uh, about languages in Spain. Let's move on. Historically, the Catholic faith played a huge role in our uh, identity, despite the fact that today only about two thirds of the country, to some degree, might say that they are very less nominally identify as Catholic. And the less of the 20% of the population goes to church. But for what it's worth, we have the Camino de Santiago, one of the largest Catholic pilgrimages in the world. The interesting thing, though, is that there is mm -hmm. noticeable traces of Maurice Arabic influence as well. Everything from architecture and even even the names of cities, for example, if they start with Al. It's even how Andalusia got its name from the Arabic Al Andalus. And today there's even noticeable words borrowed from Arabic in the Spanish language like Tatha or Azucar. That was right. great. You got it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, in regards to Spain's impact on the world, it's nothing short of massive. At one point, we had 35 colonies across the world. And today there are 19 sovereign Spanish speaking countries plus Puerto Rico that all have a story rooted from Spain. Yeah, you guys have a 
long history of Latin America. What do they think of what do they think of Spanish people? They love Europe in general. It's like, oh, Europe. So I don't know. But at the same time, they have some other thoughts about that. Like we are lazy. Or... <laughs> A lot of people, especially in South America, that think of us as very structured or like <laughs> what Spanish people think of Germans almost. Oh. <laughs> exactly. Which is and really exactly. weird for us. <laughs> so they kind of think you guys are like the Germans of the Hispanic world. Yeah. Yeah. But then in Europe, we are like, Bankrupt. Not that. <laughs> Generalizing though, not everyone Generalizing. That, but. but in regards to Spain's, you know, impact on the world, yes, we've heard the stories. Colonialism was riddled in lots of tragedy. Many wars and battles were fought. Many died. Diseases were spread. No denying these terrible historical incidents. But, and this might be one of the most hard pill to swallow controversial things I'll ever say on this show, given the current social climate that we live in, but you have to kind of see colonialism in all vantage points throughout its manifestation. In a weird way, many of the things that you hold dear today and the people that that you admire and the ideas that change the world may have never come about without ties to colonialism too. It's a weird paradox of chronological exchanges throughout history. I mean, for example, the wheel and beast of burden like horses and cattle were brought over to the Americas. Remember in the Peru episode, we explained how the only domesticated animal that could remotely help carry cargo was the llama and it could only carry like 80 pounds. Otherwise people just kind of walked to get around. See like that, history kind of has a weird way of showing you that nothing ever is completely what you think it is. And over time it kind of evolves into something you probably never saw coming. Yes, everyone likes to condemn past tragedies, but you also have to acknowledge that it's possible for a rose to grow from concrete. Like the invention of the first artificial heart in Argentina to, I don't know, Vicente Fernandez and Shakira. That's my little brief postulation on the topic. Take it as you will. I'm just saying, see before you decree. That was intense. Yeah. yeah. I like, but I like that you said it. In a way, it's hard to judge that era with today's standards and that gets really tricky. Yeah, I mean, I've been doing this for years and I know what's coming. The Spanish people and our backstory Story have so many diverse layers. And luckily, we made a video explaining all about those various groups and nationalities of Spain. So just check okay. out here quickly. Okay. Let's I will. I will. A little bit and have some fun. Let's talk. We also have art and sports and many other good things. So. Art with the sports part. No, 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 no. I am. Now they will be talking about football, right? I'm existing. Here's your trophy. This is my trophy for existing. I love it. But that's besides the point. All right, sports in Spain. So without saying much, most of you will automatically default to football. Yes, we all know that soccer is practically a religion in Spain. Their national team has qualified for the FIFA Cup 15 times, hosted in 1982 and won against the Netherlands in 2010. And of course, everybody knows about the huge rivalry between Barcelona and Real Madrid. Madrid. Which team are you on? But soccer isn't everything for Spain. Fun fact, their men's roller hockey team scored 16 gold medals. Everybody knows Rafael Nadal. Of course. And um, yeah, I already mentioned a few times that I'm not that big on football, but I love tennis. And of course, who doesn't know Rafael Nadal? But um, there is a rising star in Spanish tennis. So there is a young uh, tennis player. His name is Carlos Alcaraz, Alcaraz Garfia, as far as I'm, as far as I remember. So he is only 19 years old. So so he is quite young, but he already beat Rafael Nadal. He uh, he beat. Um, Novak Djokovic, who is a Serbian player on, and who is currently holding the, fir, uh, the first ranking in ATP. Um, and he has been holding that for several years. And he also beat Alexander Zverev, a German tennis player who is currently holding the third uh, ranking at uh, of the ATP. So, yeah. He's only 19 years old. I guess he has a long way for ahead of him. So we'll see. We'll see. Wimbledon Championship in 2008 and 2010. Their national basketball team has won one world and two Euro basket championships. Aside from all the contemporary sports, Spain also has a rich culture of domestically produced sports. Everything from patanque to canarian style wrestling. I could fight a canary. I bet you I could beat it. I don't know, man. Those things are fast. The Basque country, though, has the most native sports Basque. out of anywhere else in Spain. You have things like jayalai, stone lifting, whole 
hole drilling, wood chopping. That's my sport right there, wood chopping. In fact, Basque Country is where the running of the bulls happen. Mm, it's not Pamplona. really a sport, yes. it's more of a festival, but they love it. And there's been 15 recorded deaths, but they still love it. And finally, I know you were thinking about it. I was thinking about it. Spanish bullfighting or corrida de toros. The sport dates all the way back to Roman times. Bullfighting is kind of seen as a performance art mixed with a sport. Sport. The matador attempts to subdue, immobilize, or kill the bull in the arena. The Arabs, the Catholics, the frickin' Bourbons, they all tried to ban it, but it kept coming back. In recent years, the sport has yet again been met with a lot of backlash. In fact, it was completely banned in Catalonia in 2010. Well, I'm gonna get out of here, and you know what? I'm proud of this trophy. Thank you, Art. Yeah. Also about sports, uh, so there is one more sport, well, it is not originated, uh, it was not originated in Spain, um, so it is padel. Um, it was originated in Mexico, I think, but it is very, very um, popular in Spain. When I took some tennis uh, lessons in Spain, so the tennis courts were not always busy or they were empty sometimes and paddle well courts can i can i say even that because they are uh closed usually unlike unlike tennis courts almost always there were people playing paddle but not always um there were people playing tennis so I guess it says something about the popularity of the sport. Yeah, people in Spain are pretty active. Which is actually uh, kind of funny considering that you guys have that whole siesta culture thing and you guys are known for being lazy, like... Oh, oh come, come on! on. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't taken a siesta in two years. Yeah, but that's because yeah. you lived here. <laughs> that was nice. Yeah, about the siesta thing. I loved it as well when I was there, uh, when I lived in Spain. So, uh, so I studied the university and what I liked was the schedule we had all, only three lessons per day they were quite long but still so the earliest that a lesson can start was 10 a.m which was already good because well the majority of places that i've been to always all well most of the time they start their working day at somewhere around 8 a.m so 10 a.m. was already good. So we had a, we had lessons from 10 to 1 p.m., which was well three three hours of a lesson, which was quite long. But then from 1 p.m. till 3 p.m., there were no lessons, no classes at all. Uh, the administrative uh, staff were also um, free at that time, so they didn't work in this period from 1 p.m. till 3 p.m you just had your siesta time so you could of course you could sleep a little bit uh what what i did was usually i just spent my time in the canteen which by the way luckily was working at that time which was good yeah but i like this i like this um uh, this siesta thing no, what, what, I think we are not lazy, guys, okay? Also, siesta doesn't make you lazy. It recharges uh, you. Doesn't recharge you, no. <laughs> you wake up worse than you went to sleep. Wow, that's only in Valencia. Meanwhile. That's only not Valencia. Miracle. Oh, and speaking of stereotypes, what about the whole, like, nudity thing? I thought that that was something normal in the rest of the world. Oh. On the beach, on the beach. No one pays attention to that. Like, it's yeah. no anything weird, but we don't go naked through the street, like... Right, right. So, in conclusion, stereotype debunked. Nudity is not legal legal in Spain, but it's okay in some beaches. All right, enough culture talk. Now we got to move on to Hannah. That's her segment. So now here's Hannah with culture stuff. Hi guys, it is good to be back. And remember that you can get a random Hannah t-shirt at geographynow.com. It has my faith, faith. It has my faith on it and it's better than Keith. Ernest Hemingway once said, there is no nightlife in Spain. They stay up late and they get up late. That is not nightlife. That is delaying the day. Interestingly enough, they have one of the highest life expectancies in the world. Maybe night parties do the trick. In any case, Spain has been a front runner in arts and literature. So many people like these have made internationally famous pieces of literature. None more famous than Miguel de Cervantes Don Quixote. In addition, so many world-renowned artists have come from Spain, including the the Spanish Trinity, Pablo Picasso, Diego Velazquez, and Francisco Goya. He had some really dark works because he went uh, deaf and the Spanish Inquisition really hated it. But of course, you cannot forget Anthony Gaudi's of architecture. 
and surrealist Salvador Dali, literally buried in his own museum. Literally my favorite artist of all time. Spain is a hub of many inventions, such as the spacesuit, the stapler, the predecessor to the helicopter, the gyroplane, the wheelchair, glasses, foosball, and the discovery of the elements, tungsten, vanadium, and platinum. Now, just very quickly, let's talk about some cinema stuff. Explore the political climate with movies like Pan's Labyrinth, which is actually a Mexican movie, but does explore some aspects of Spanish culture and the Spanish Civil War. Take a tour of the beautiful Basque country by watching the movie Ocho Apaidos Vascos. I hope I'm saying that right. Is that right? Good enough. If you want to take a trip back to the Middle Ages and explore Spain's royalty culture, you can watch Juana la Loca. And everybody knows the famous actresses that came out of Spain like Antonio Banderas, Penelope Cruz, Javier Bardem. Anyways, you get the point. There is way too much film history to get into right now, but if you want to learn more, watch Filmography Now, guys. The first official spin-off channel of Geography Now. And it has a spin-off. And finally, Spain is the land of festivals. Literally, every day you can find something happening. Tomatina. You've probably heard of oh, La yes. Tomatina, La Faria in mm -hmm. April, Semana Santa, and one thing that unifies the Spaniards is music. Unfortunately, Keith has made his way back from Florida to Los Angeles. I don't know what to do with myself. I thought he was gone forever and he's freaking back. It's here to do the music segment. You guys kind of like him, so here he is. Whatever. Have fun. Whee! I'm back. I'm back in the studio. My segment kicks not her segment. By the way, everybody, over the years, I've worn Rush shirts many times. Everybody knows Rush is my favorite band. Blah, 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 Rush. Don't sue, whatever. Anyways, so fun fact, and since I have such a love affair with guitars and things with strings, especially G strings, haha, <laughs> but um... <laughs> The modern classical guitar was actually invented in Spain. This is actually a steel string. Spain is one of the very few countries that actually has no words in their national anthem. Each region of Spain actually has its own traditional style of music. The most well-known style of music that everybody around the world probably knows is flamenco music. Predominantly founded in the southern region of Spain and mostly the city of Seville. Highly recommend ch checking out Paco de Lucia, who's a phenomenal flamenco guitar player. I would have to explain flamenco music as a finger style on guitar. So, for example, said acoustic guitar, if you take these two, or sorry, these three fingers and you anchor your thumb, you kind of do this motion here. You can also, you like, use your right hand as a kind of more percussive. In addition, most regions in Spain actually have their own style of dance, which is called the jota. The rhythms in the dance either are three, four, or six, eight. It's like one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. It's basically the same thing. It feels faster, but it's not actually faster. Eventually, after the fall of the dictatorship, you had a bunch of amazing musicians come out, such as Rocio Jorado, La Pantoja, Joaquin Sabina, Rosalia, she's won like a bunch of Grammys. I don't know, it's just like whenever I watch some like Latin soap opera or something and I put the chick in the big dress, and he cheated on me. Right in Spanish, I'm just yes. All like, Whoa. So that's it for me, you guys. I would just like to say thanks to Paul Barbato for flying me out to here to LA. So glad to have you back, Keith. Oh my God, it's Woo! great to be back. Woo. I missed In and Out and all of the glorious fast food that is in LA. <laughs> Woo! Thank you, Keith. All right, and with that, it's time to move on to the friend zone, shall we? All right, so Jose, Anna, how do you feel about the way how Spain interacts with the rest of the world? Because of the language, I feel like we might feel closer to Latin American countries for the most part. People think that we are not that good at English. And okay, I probably have shown in this video that I'm not that good at English. I'm sorry, I just no, had a long great. day, okay? You're doing great, you're okay? doing great. It's harder for us because we are, come from a Latin language. Yeah. Yeah. So a German person is gonna be able to understand and learn faster English than yes. us, so. Obviously, Spain has a huge impact on the world. So first off, of course, in Africa, it's interesting. The area of Western Sahara used to be a Spanish colony, which is now de facto run by Morocco, but with a dispute with the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic. Although Spain has never formally recognized the SADR, Spain does host a noticeable community of Sahrawi people on the Canary Islands. And on top of that, the whole Ceuta and Melilla thing kind of irks Morocco just a bit to say the least. Nonetheless, they try to keep things cordial and every new prime minister usually makes a trip to Morocco for their first diplomatic mission abroad. 
Otherwise, they have very close relations with their former colonies, the closest probably being Argentina, as they have the largest diaspora of Spaniards outside of Spain with almost half a million. And it's well known throughout the Latin world that Argentina probably has the biggest crush on Spain, so the more they get time with them, the better. Cuba and Venezuela are high up on the list too, Cuba being the last American colony to gain independence, and they have always been fond of Spain's values. Venezuela specifically has very close ties to the Canary Islands. They even speak almost with the exact same accent, and half of everybody on the islands have friends or family in Venezuela. Back to Europe though, Andorra is like the Beverly Hills where the Spaniards move when they hit it big and want to hide their money. However, if we're going to get really personal, Portugal is like the little brother they have shared every moment of their history with. And they love to see him try. Like, whenever Portugal accomplishes anything, Spain is their number one cheerleader. Like, Spain knows they are four times bigger and have a way heavier socioeconomic impact on Europe and the world. So, of course, let adorable Portugal have a Ronaldo or Magellan. They deserve some spotlight. Spain can't have it all. When it comes to their best friends, however, literally almost every single Spaniard I have talked to has said the same country. Italy. It's no shocker. When a Spaniard and Italian meet, there is an instant connection. They just share the same South Latin vibe and code of conduct that goes back millennia to the Roman Empire. They can easily learn each other's languages, they approve of the other's food and music, they both laugh at stories of crazy dictatorships and underground mafia drama over a glass of wine. In the end, evidently, Spain and Italy are the kings and queens of South Europe. Alright, and in conclusion, I think you guys should take it away. I'm out. <laughs> we are welcoming and um, the cool thing about Spain is like you have many different cultures within the same country, so you can live completely different experiences. We like to party. That, I'm not gonna say no, wrong with that. we love that. Because we are social people, I yeah. think that's something that we need. A lot of those things I took for granted being in Spain, the rich diversity yeah. or, you know, welcoming nature. And once I moved out, which more than 10 years ago, that's when I really started realizing yeah. how lucky we are to be from Spain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, have some real paella. And <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! Thank you guys so much for being in this episode. And with that, stay tuned. Sri Lanka is coming up next. All right, so... That's it. Yeah, I like the video, this episode a lot. I really learned a lot in this episode. Uh, yeah, their later episodes, uh, they are longer. Like this one is 33 minutes. Yeah, and they pack a lot of information about the country. By the way, uh, uh, yeah, about the last um saying of the girl so she said that well we like to party a lot and they are by the way people are quite loud um and they also uh, something was mentioned about that they stay up quite late which is also true and i experienced that so the name uh, my neighbors well in the apartment that i was renting they were up until 12 a.m., 1 a.m. on weekdays. I'm not talking about, uh, I'm not even talking about uh, weekends. And for me, so I, well, I needed to wake up, okay, maybe not at 6 a.m. Because, well, as I mentioned, I my uh, classes didn't start, didn't start until 10 a.m. But still, I did have to go to sleep. I'm not sure why the, uh, why my neighbors didn't um, didn't have to go to sleep. That was interesting. But yeah, and by the way, about loudness. At first, I mean, they were so loud. I was I thought that they were quarreling. But then I asked my Spanish roommate, and she th uh, she said like, no, no, they they are just discussing something, you know. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it was so funny. <laughs> Yeah, um, in addition maybe to the places that worth visiting in Spain, because of course uh, they didn't mention that many places, it's not like I am um, accusing them of not uh, mentioning some places, of course not, Spain is so large, it has a lot of places to visit, but I would just like to mention one place which I uh, visited myself. Uh, it is located in the Basque Country. It is called Gastelugace, and it is famous maybe for two reasons now. So the first reason, well, because it's a very beautiful place. It just really, it is amazing. 
The second reason is because one of the most um, famous TV <clears throat> series was shot there. And this TV series is called The Game of Thrones. The seventh season was, uh, short, uh, was shot there. And something about the Dragonstone... I haven't watched the the <clears throat> this TV show, so I don't. I'm not sure what is it, what what it means. But I guess those who watched should recognize what I'm talking about. But anyway, um, even those that haven't watched this um, TV show, this is the place that I would highly recommend to visit if you are ever. Uh, somewhere in the north of Spain because it is there. It is very beautiful, but you need to remember that north and northeast of Spain, well, it is located um, on the Bay of Biscay. Biscay? Biscay? Actually, I'm not sure about the pronunciation here. So the weather is quite rainy. And it can rain in summer, in winter, and all year round. But I think the rainiest season is winter. I went to Gasto Lugace in winter. And particularly on that day, it was not only raining a lot, but also it was very, very windy. But, uh, so it was, not the, it was not the best time to visit uh, the place. But I liked it very, very much. So I would definitely recommend it. All right. So that's it uh, with my reaction to this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, the authors, for doing this video and for doing all the other videos. They are great. Yeah. Thank you guys for watching. Let me know in the comments what you think. And see you guys in my next reaction video. Bye.